I have a confession to make. I hate museums. I'm not an art guy. I come from the business world, and the paintings have nothing to do with me. I don't know what I'm supposed to think about. When I'm in a museum, usually my feet hurt. Get me out of here. All right, that's how I felt until about four years ago when I had an amazing experience. A woman brought me to the Metropolitan Museum of Art on a romantic date. This is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'm sure you've probably heard of it. A lot of you have probably been there. In New York City, this is the most popular museum. Over six million visitors every year. In fact, this is the most popular museum in all of North America. But to me and my friends who live in New York City, this place is just a tourist attraction. Right? This is the type of place you go when your parents are visiting you. We didn't have a relationship with this place until that night. She invited me to go there. It was our third date, and I said, okay. We went in the middle of December, so it was cold and it was snowy. It was a Saturday night, and not many people were at the museum because of the snow. It looked a little something like this. She began to give me a private tour, and something magical happened. She started to show me these objects that she liked paintings, and sculpture, and Egyptian artifact, and furniture. And I don't know if it was the, the very romantic mood lighting. Or if it was the snow coming down outside. Or maybe it was just having a very attractive woman talk to me. <laughs> But that night, uh, that night I fell in love with the museum. I'm not joking. I, I really fell in love with the museum and I started going there every weekend. It unlocked within me a sense of curiosity about history and art that I never knew that I had. See, during the week, I sold electronic equipment that was used in military planes and private jets. I loved my job and I was really good at it. But this became my hobby on the weekends. It became the thing that I was obsessed with. I did YouTube videos. I read things on Wikipedia about the museum. I did the guided tours. I joined as a member. I loved it so much that I started to do free tours for my friends. <laughs> These are some photos of me doing my free tours. Now, remember, I'm a business major from college. I have never taken an art history class. These were not very sophisticated museum tours. They were basically, in fact, like uh, 10 cool things I found at the museum and three things that I want to steal. On my tours, I would bring my friends up to an object like this. This is called a Goa stone case, and it was made in the year 1700 on the west coast of India. Meant to house a, a little ball, like a billiard ball, called a Goa stone, that people believed had magical, mystical properties. 
They thought that you could take a Goa stone and you could drop it into a well and it would cure the plague for a hundred miles around. They thought you could take a Goa stone and shave off a piece of it into a cup of tea and it would cure any type of poison. It was worth way more than its weight in gold. On my tours, we would walk up to this object. We would press our faces up to the glass. And we would look at the craftsmanship and I would ask my friends, I would say, think about it. What would you put inside of this if you stole it? Uh, Their answer, by the way, was usually chocolate or drugs. (laughs) So those are the tours that I love to give, and I started doing them every single weekend. My friends told their friends, and their friends told their friends. We started doing birthday parties. Uh, This is a photo of one of those birthday parties that we did. Uh, we just had so much fun doing these. One day, a very popular blog wrote about my tours, and the next day, a thousand people emailed me (laughs) wanting to join one of these tours. It was crazy. It was like a full-time hobby. Uh, I'm very happy to tell you that two years ago, I quit my job and I started a new company. The company is called Museum Hack. And my goal, my mission that I work for every single day now is to reimagine the adult museum experience. Today, I'm going to tell you the three things that our tours do differently than most museum tours. And then I'm going to tell you why this matters. First, the three things that we do differently is is very simple. It comes down to these three things, guides, games, and gossip. I'm going to start with our guides because our tour guides are the heart and soul of our business. They're the reason that our customers love us and that they come back and tell their friends. See, we do something different. We hire for storytelling first. We think that storytelling is actually more important than art history. Because I can teach you about the art and I can teach you about the museum, but it's a lot harder to teach you to connect with people. And so we hire for that first and foremost. In fact, we don't have job interviews, we have job auditions. We hire people from all walks of life. We get scientists, renegade museum employees, we get musicians, We get actors and educators. We hire people like this woman. Her name is Leah. She's here with me in Sweden now. She loves this work of art. We hire people like Ethan. He is an educator. He loves that work of art. (laughs) What's special about our tours is there's no set route. The guides are driven by passion. They come up with their own tours. Each tour is completely different based on things that they love, and they love a lot. So our tours are very fast-paced. On the average museum hack tour, you see two to three times as many objects as most museum tours. We move so fast, in fact, that (laughs) we have to use some games to keep the pace moving. One of the games we borrow from sports. We, we start the tour in the same way every time before we go into the museum. We say, welcome to the museum. Uh, we need everybody to put their hands in the middle. And they really do this. Everybody puts their hands in the middle. We say, look, we have to operate as a team today. We're going to be moving fast. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to start this museum tour with a little cheer. We're going to go down on Mew, up on (laughs) Zium. And that's what everybody does. They put their hands in and they go, museum. (laughs) And then they go into the museum. Because what we're providing here is not a museum tour. This is a museum adventure. Right? 
People today, right, this is the ADG generation. I'm on my phone every two to three minutes. That's what we have to compete with. Have you ever been at a museum and instead of looking at the art, maybe after 20 or 30 minutes, instead of thinking about the art and how the art affects you, you start to think about how a cup of coffee would affect you? or a big glass of wine. That's a real thing, ladies and gentlemen. It is called museum fatigue. (laughs) And we've developed some activities and exercises to combat that, fatigue-fighting exercises. We will do yoga in the modern and contemporary gallery. (laughs) We will run up the stairwells. We will pass out candy in the hallways. We'll have a big glass of wine on our nighttime tours. We'll do shots of espresso. We'll do whatever we need to do to keep you engaged, right? Because that's what's really, really important for us. Taking pictures in a museum today, it's a very controversial subject. We love to take pictures at the museum. (laughs) We encourage selfies because let's be honest, You look awesome in a museum. (laughs) We do a lot of these activities and games to move it fast, but my favorite part of the tours has to be the last one, this gossip. Gossip is the juicy backstories that happen when we tell people about the art, right? We think that Today's audiences have to be entertained before they can be educated. So gossip is very, very important. A lot of people come and visit us at the museum, but one of my favorite demographics is a group that we lovingly call finance bros. These are people who are first in their category of income, they are first in their category of intelligence, but oftentimes the last place they want to be is at the museum. They're dragged there for a corporate event or for a date, and when they come into the museum, we say, welcome, we're going to start this tour a little different. We're going to go to the most expensive piece of art that the museum has ever paid cash money for. (laughs) We take them up the halls to this tiny little Duccio painting (laughs) that's about the size of an iPad. It's tiny. And the Metropolitan Museum of Art paid $45 million for this object. That's over a million dollars per square inch. It's a little controversial to talk about how much things cost in an art museum, but we found that that's what our visitors want, and we're not afraid to talk about controversial things. I mean, just look at our slogan. Our slogan and the motto that we wake up to every day is that museums are fucking awesome. Guides, games, and gossip. These are the three things that we do differently. But why museums? Why does this stuff matter? To talk about that, I I have to talk about my favorite piece of art in the entire world. I think I've seen it more than 300 times and I still get excited. It is an Egyptian artifact called Fragment of a Queen's Face. I know it might look modern or contemporary to you, but in fact, this is very, very old. It's over 3,000 years old. It's a beautiful yellow color uh, made from a material called yellow jasper. Yellow jasper is a semi-precious stone, and you need to know two things about yellow jasper. Number one, at the time this was made, yellow jasper was very rare. 
It was so rare that the next largest piece of yellow jasper in the whole museum is no bigger than your thumbnail. So for this, the the whole face and hands and feet would have been yellow jasper. Amazing. But the second thing about yellow jasper that you got to know is that it's insanely hard to work with. On the hardness scale of one to seven, where diamond is a seven, uh, yellow jasper is a solid five. It makes marble look like a stick of butter. And so to get the detail and the polish on the face and on those lips is amazing. I was talking to a curator about this work and he said, this piece is incredible. There's a lot of mystery, he said about it. We don't exactly know who it is. He said, but more than that, it's that we have no idea how this was made. He said, there are no surviving examples of the tools which could have been used to even get the polish and definition on those lips. And this woman was listening to us talk and she stuck her head in and she goes, I bet it was the aliens. (laughs) She did not work at the museum, by the way. I look at this statue and I see those lips and I get butterflies in my stomach. I look at the statue and I feel something. I think if the lips looked like this, could you imagine what the rest of it looked like? She would have been presented to the pharaoh, maybe wearing a Nubian wig and a dress entirely out of feathers. Her hands and feet would have been yellow jasper. It would have been amazing. I look at this piece and I feel something. And I think that that's what a great work of art is. Because 3,000 years ago, I couldn't talk to the Egyptians. I don't speak the language. I can't read hieroglyphics. But today, I see this and I get butterflies. I think that a great piece of art can communicate through time. Museums like the Metropolitan Museum of Art are encyclopedic collections of human history. And the greatest compliment that I ever got from someone who came on one of our tours is why we do what we do. He said, I've been at this museum for two hours now. He's a music video director from Los Angeles. He said, I never would have come here, but I've really enjoyed my time. He said, I've seen these works of art that are a hundred, that are 500, that are a thousand years old. He said, I've seen these works of art that are a hundred, that are 500, that are a thousand years old, that have withstood the test of time. And then I look at my own work and I wonder if that will stand the test of time. He said, Being at this museum has made me want to be a better creator. My name is Nick Gray. The name of my company is Museum Hack. We think that museums are fucking awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.